All right, welcome to this video. We're gonna be talking about uh, how to get your sci-fi to the next level. You know, some things that make sci-fi look generic or maybe are things that are holding you back when it comes to creating sci-fi. So just to kind of go over this, I found all these images on Google. Uh, these are my opinions. I don't really think there's such thing as absolute right or wrong in art, but if you wanna design commerci commercially or just get your sci-fi skills up, uh, these are some common beginner mistakes to help you make yourself stand out and maybe see sci-fi in a different light than you currently do, you know? Sci-fi is functional. Sci-fi is aesthetic. But most importantly, the real-world rules of making things don't change. You know, they evolve, both functionally and aesthetically. Good sci-fi is grounded in reality and purpose, both artistic and functional purpose. That style and purpose is up to you, but the choices and details you add should be with intent and reasoning. It's really important to try and avoid total randomness. Visual design, the idea of form, balance, hierarchy, flow, and composition, these all apply to hard surface and hard surface design. We must remember that art is a visual communication language. If we want to create production art, we have to know how to interface with the audience and communicate with the ideas, themes, functions, and aesthetics of our designs. To do this, we must build a visual library and learn about these fundamentals. While we are not covering those fundamentals in this video, I will give you a starting point to improve your sci-fi if you're struggling, and also some additional... For the next section of this video, we're going to be talking about cliché details and things that I see happen a lot uh, when people are getting into sci-fi. So uh, let's start off with the bolt in every corner detail. So my friend Kai, who has gone way, way better since then, lent me his old sci-fi and so one thing I see a lot is people love to put bolts in every single corner of their design and they split every single panel along every seam. I would say if you want to start making more appealing sci-fi, find a more interesting way to place these. Uh, here's another example. Just placing the bolts in every single corner, I believe it makes it feel a lot more low tech and I'm not saying you can't do it but it's better to usually find a more aesthetically pleasing way of doing it. For example, here, he does it in selective corners, not always in the most uh, of the corners, and he also finds interesting places to put them that make it a little more complex, such as between two parts. So I think if you just try and avoid this detail, you're gonna be a lot better off and find a more interesting way to be placing your bolts. So the next cliche detail I'd like to talk about is caution tape. And basically, when it comes to caution tape, I just say use it sparingly. Use it functionally and do it aesthetically. Uh, you know, it adds a very strong color to your scene, a very recognizable pattern. It's very intense and visually strong. And it should only be used in functional places, in places that make sense. You know, when you see it on walls where someone doesn't really need to be afraid of the wall or you know, they're not going to trip over some piece of metal that's up here on the seam, right? Like, think about why you're placing caution tape and do it aesthetically pleasing. I like this example because I think it adds some color to the door, which is otherwise monochromatic. And it's very subtle and used in a way that basically is saying, like, as this door shuts, like, watch out. You know, it's very, it's very purposeful. You know, when you place color in a scene, usually you place, or on a design, you're placing it in areas of function or interaction or warning you of something or telling you some information, right? So uh, color choices and placement usually have a, a very strong and intentional purpose. So I think that's something I see a lot. Try to avoid it. Another cliche detail I'd like to talk about is called the inset existing geo detail. Uh, I don't really know what else to call it, but here's some examples I made. Uh, a lot of times when people are especially starting out, right, it's hard to break the box. It's hard to make more complicated things and your visual library isn't developed enough. But while your visual library might not be developed enough, it's good to know where you can improve. So one thing I see oftentimes in 3D art is people are going to start adding insets and extrusions based on existing polygons. Uh, for example, here you can see that there's a box here. And so it's very easy for a 3D artist to go select these polys and extrude it down. But the problem is that's not very a very strong design choice. It's a little uninteresting and a bit too easy, right? Uh, we'll talk about breaking the box later on, but I suggest trying to maybe offset the shape, add bevels to it, add an additional detail. Just take it one step further 
to try and break that box and make it feel a little bit more unique and uh, less like your artistic choices are driven by your polygons. You know, for example, on this door, you can see that this person's uh, shape of the door guided how they made their extrusions and geometry choices. I know that they had poly flows like this, and so they in extruded these details inwards and they extruded this panel inwards. Uh, it's just a typical thing that we do as we're learning to model, right? You know, more complicated shapes take longer and are harder to figure out. So if you see yourself doing these things, um, you know, try and just be mindful of it and see if you can find a better way because a better way isn't necessarily too much extra work. You know, for example, around this door frame, I know that this person had this existing geo and so they just didn't set it. Uh, yeah. I would just say that if you want to make your sci-fi stand out, try and push that out of your workflow and learn how to try and add a bit of, you know, extra elegance to your shapes and to your details. So the next cliche uh, sci-fi detail I'd like to talk about is the sandwiching effect. It's not really a detail as much as it is a phenomena. So something that I see happens a lot is people start designing very evenly sized strips of vertical pieces. And so they create like this sandwich effect, right? And it's pretty hard to avoid at times, you know, it's it's very natural to start creating these things. And so you have to be, be uh, cautious about them and, and cognizant of what you're creating. So it's pretty easy to start creating these similarly sized strips of uh, in similar intensity detail, right? And so it becomes hard to distinguish all of these plane changes. Uh, you know, you see the sandwiching effect happen in a lot of different areas. So, for example, you know, here we can see that there's a lot of evenly sized plane changes and details, where if we had a bit more rest area here, and then we focus a lot of our details in other areas, or in maybe more concentrated areas, it would have a little bit less of that sandwiching effect. The next cliche sci-fi detail I'd like to talk about is the sawtooth uh, design. And the sawtooth design basically happens when you have a line and you repeat this 45 degree angle tooth shape over and over. I mean, imagine if that was a saw blade, right? Like these are the little saw teeth. Uh, and so what happens is when you tile this, you're gonna be getting this sawtooth design. I see this quite a bit. And I think that the more that you work on expanding your visual library, the more that you can find new alternatives to this. You know, play with different proportions, play with different shapes. Don't be afraid to try and, and uh, break out of these thing, these limitations created by our tools, right? Like these are easier to model shapes. And so it's very typical for us to stick within what we know. But if you wanna push out of this zone try and build up a new library of forms and functions and things to help you ideate new shapes and ideas, right? So I see this one a lot and I just wanted to bring it to people's attention. All right, so the final sci-fi cliche detail that I would like to talk about is vents. This is my personal opinion. I see this a lot. I think it stems from the same reason as 45 degree angles, boxy shapes, uh, soft tooth designs, but it's vents. Vents are a functional thing. Everyone knows what a vent does. You know, every student puts vents and then they put some sort of uh, smoke coming out of it or something, right, in one of their scenes. And I think the problem that I have with vents is while vents are functional, I think there's always a more futuristic and aesthetic way to do them. And they shouldn't be used as a way to fill space. Uh, they should be used with intention and purpose rather than just some random thing to put there, right? Uh, remember, sci-fi, unless you're doing like industrial sci-fi and you don't care about aesthetics, sci-fi is should look, you know, futuristic and functional, but also cool and maybe unique or elegant, right? And so I think finding a more manu true manufactured way or a more interesting pattern or shape to your vents will help to make it stand out. So that's just my personal opinion, uh, but yeah. 
All right, so we covered a lot of the cliche details. I want to talk about cables and pipes and just my philosophy and thoughts on them. So when it comes to cable and pipes, I think that there's many ways to do them. Uh, when we think about the types of cables and pipes that there are, there's usually two different types. There's, uh, you know, sing well, I guess there's like three. There's singular pipes and cables, so it's like one piece. Then there's organized cables that follow some sort of intention or s they're part of a larger system and they have some sort of flow to them and they're very functional or maybe they're like USB cable or uh, Ethernet cables, right? So for example, we have like these types of cables and then we also have uh, disorganized cables, right? And so I think it's really important to know when and where to use them and what makes these good and bad. So a lot of times in sci-fi design, I see people putting cables, just like random electrical cables and pipes on their guns in ways that don't make sense functionally. You know, someone hit those cables, they get ripped off. And it just looks very, very odd to me where there's guns like this, where it has a pipe. But not only does it say it's function, but it's integrated into the design. It's not tacked onto it. It's not outside of it. it you know, it, this would be protected by the parts around the gun. This is a great implementation of a pipe into a design. Uh, a lot of times what I see is usually very evenly sized pipes and then they just go from one side of a panel to the other. There's no real integration, there's no elegance or grouping or feeling of, uh, feeling of them being built into something bigger or actually integrated into a structure where this is a great example, you know, the pipes are tucked into an area, they're protected, they look like they're a part of the structure, someone took the time to model them into the walls. I think that this is a great approach. Um, so I made these quick two images here to just talk about my philosophy versus one thing that I see a lot. So I always see this evenly sized pipes uh, that go straight through these wall panels and they're on the outside of a wall. Uh, I see this a lot in sci-fi corridors. I suggest, and the way that I like to do it personally is, you know, if you wanna add a lot of detail, right? But you want it to be reading well, you need hierarchy big, medium, small. And so what I like to do is I usually have a, a master pipe and then I have a secondary one and then I have a tertiary smaller pipes, right? And so you can have one big one and then a multiple smaller ones and you can group them together and you can start creating these more interesting combinations. And that's not the only way to do it, but it's just one way to think about it, right? Don't try and think about pipes and think about what's the most cool pattern you can arrange them in or like what would be interesting to look at uh, and I think it makes more sense right like imagine if someone built a conduit for piping and cabling chances are that a lot of those place those pipes and cables might go to similar places or to reduce the amount of internal structure that they have to build out to carry these conduits maybe they group them together right so like maybe this one carries uh, you know some sort of gas or it carries a bunch of fiber optic cables and then these carry you know maybe these are gas or something else and then this one's water you know it it helps to bring a little bit more finesse to, than just a simple pipe by itself and so when it comes to integrating them i see this one a lot where it's just barely integrated or it's not even at all and so i'm not saying this is the only way to do it but Trying to build your pipes into your structures makes them feel a bit more elegant, more purpose-built, and more grounded, in my opinion. Uh, now, if you're going for like a, you know a current day military, you know real world thing, then yeah, you can do this. But I think keeping this idea of integrating it in a more interesting way is going to always be cooler. It doesn't have to be crazy, but add some elegance to it and I think you're going to be creating better pipes and cables. Um, add junctions, you know, try and just break the box, break the repetition and try and make them feel like they're really meant to be there. You know, I like this, these examples, right? Like Paul Papera had a bunch of very organized, very purposeful pipes that look very integrated, but then he also has very uh, busy and very, or sorry, not busy, but more disorganized cables, but they're tucked behind them. They're of less intensity. So it feels very functional. It doesn't feel like random cables. 
And so it feels like there's some sort of logic, right, in order to it all. Like, for example, these cables are designed to carry some sort of fluid to a system, right? Like, that's why they're loose. They need to be loose because it articulates. There's reasoning behind it. These pipes don't need to be loose. They need to be very rigid and, uh, you know, carry maybe air around or some sort of other fluid. So try and find interesting ways to do it. I think this is a great example. Like, this is a cool way to make groups of cables. This is a cool way to take a simple idea and elevate it, right? Different shapes, different patterns, different ways of grouping them, different connections. So try and just find either some sort of organization or pattern or way to take the pipes and cables and, and give them a function. And if they don't have like some sort of super aesthetic look and they are more like this, try and at least make the shapes of the flow of the cable like Try and make these things dynamic and interesting rather than, uh, you know, a bit, uh, a bit static, right? So anyway, that's my thoughts on pipes. I know that was six minutes, but uh, hopefully that's helpful. I see these things a lot, and I think it can help give your pipes, which is a generic detail, a bit of realism to it and more interest. So find the coolest way of doing pipes, and it's going to look cooler, right? So the next thing I'd like to talk about is breaking the box. Um, breaking the box is a subject that I'm really uh, excited to talk about and I like to talk about. Um, you know, when people paint pictures right, you generally want to hide your brush strokes or when you sculpt something, you don't want people to be saying, oh, I know how he modeled that or I know how he painted that. And so uh, I find that this rule is really important for designing in both 3D and 2D and it's hard to do this for different reasons. So one thing I see a lot of times is artists who, you know, don't have a super strong understanding of manipulating form and they're starting out with a 3D software drawing, right? When you're learning to draw, they teach you to be very accurate, very precise. They want you to understand form. But the problem is a lack of visual library and a lack of experimenting with form makes it hard for you to draw and imagine these and also accurately it takes practice right and so a lot of times people start out they they tend to gravitate towards more simple shapes they gravitate towards more blocky shapes uh, when they're drawing and when they're modeling because breaking the box is hard to do you know it takes practice it takes time um, and so i see people a lot of times who get limited by this understanding of form and so I tend to call these people you know boxes and cylinder modelers where it's basically they can't break out of that arena very easily and especially when they're designing like it's one thing to be able to model a gun from reference but it's another one to be able to design a gun and create interesting forms so like here's an example of a simple box that's breaking the box right you can't really, I mean, you can tell how it's made if you think about it, but it's much more sophisticated, right? It's very simple. There's these large bevels, something you typically wouldn't see 3D tools uh, creating easily unless you knew how to do it and it's very intentional. Uh, yeah, so I think that breaking the box is one of the harder things to do, um, but basically the idea is to add more elegance, right? Like these boxes may seem, or these shapes may seem very... Uh, simple at first, but when you really look at the forms, there's huge bevels and huge plane changes to help break this and give it some nice elegance, right? And that's something that I think is really important to do, you know, whether it's for product design or sci-fi, you know, you have to break the box. You don't want to be limited by your tools or by your drawing, uh, like accurate drawing techniques. And you can learn how to be accurate and create crazy forms, but it's definitely a lot harder, right? Like that's one thing I really appreciate about Brian Sum is his forms are very good. They're believable, you know, they make enough sense and there's enough structure and underlying uh, like, you know, hierarchy, understanding how plant to transition forms and like the understanding of forms and combining different shapes. That's what makes this so good, right? And it takes a long time to get to this level or even close to this level. But 
it's just you have to learn how to break the box. You have to learn how to try new shapes and forms. And so I think that this is one of the things that I see people struggle a lot with, right? Like if you can take a simple box and break it, I think that's when you're gonna start being successful, right? You don't want people to look at your model and immediately know how you did it in one or two operations. That's just my personal philosophy. That's why I appreciate people like Vitaly Bogorov or you know, Paul Papera. You can't easily see how they model these things. They feel natural and they have uh, that technical execution and that design of these compound and complex forms that, that, that makes it feel exceptional, both artistically because they, it unlocks his ability to create things that are grounded because he can make more interesting shapes, right? Because of the technical skills. So learning how to break the box and design and you know, on a technical side is crucial in my opinion. And you don't have to be doing anything crazy to break the box. Uh, you can make a box design very simple and very pleasing, but that's also an art in itself. So one thing that I thought was really interesting when I was learning about design is somebody said, oh, like this, uh, you know, like my coworker Jahoon said, oh, this is a good box design. This is a good cylinder design. And I never thought about it like that. Like, yeah, that's really important. Like if someone can make a box look cool, what else can they make look cool? Right? So uh, that's just my personal opinion. I think that not every design has to be some crazy complex thing, but even in a, you know, very, very simple product designs, uh, let me pull one up really quick. Like even in simple product designs, people break the box constantly. Like something like a lot of these things, right? Like for example, this corner, I am hard pressed to find somebody who is designing in a polygon modeling software who would do a form transition like this. Because these are things that are not easy to come up with, especially in a, a modeling software, right? Uh, for example, transitioning this form from back here, like these types of bevels, these soft transitions to these harder, these harder shapes, like understanding how to do all that on a technical level isn't easy for everyone. And so designing it and knowing how to model it is even harder. But if you want to push your sci-fi, learning how to do these things in your designs and in your modeling is what's going to take it to the next level. You know, break that box, break out of your tools, uh, like restrictions. So that's my thoughts on it. And hopefully some people found this helpful. All right, so the next thing I'd like to talk about is greebles. Greebles are essentially random detail plastered all over something. Uh, they don't have function, and they're generally sort of boxy shapes. Uh, not all the time, but this is something that's very typical in generally more retro art, and especially in sci-fi. You know, when we think of greebles, we're 99% chance going to think of, you know, Star Wars, right? And it's not that greebles are necessarily bad. But I think that if we want to create more modern, more futuristic, more elegant sci-fi, we need to be trying to break the box. And if we're going to have greebles, give them some purpose and give their placement some purpose, right? I, don't, I think that it's, to me personally, I think it's more important to add something with intention than, not, than to add something without knowing why I'm adding it artistically or functionally. Uh, so for example, on this piece, you know, I, I don't understand what a lot of these things do, especially like these pieces. They feel like maybe they're mechanisms, but they're really just sort of these random details, right? Or what does this piece here do? What does this mechanism do? Where if you look at someone like Paul Paperas, he does have a lot of details. He has a lot of things, but they all look like they have a purpose or they're supporting some sort of functional thing, right? Uh, they're placed in very organized and uh, important focused groups and areas. You know, there's rest area, and then he places these functional detailed pieces. And so there's a nice balance of all these things. It doesn't feel like anything is lacking purpose, right? It feels like there's some sort of logic behind the placement. And so it's really important to be having either an artistic choice, like for example, 
it's important to group your details. When you group your details, you naturally create areas of rest and areas of complexity. He does this. That's an artistic reason of choosing to place details in a place. Or maybe he goes by the rule, well, this is where, uh, you know, this structure, the pipes are ending here. They're going to be transitioning a fluid or some sort of, or serving some sort of other mechanical uh, function for this mechanism here. So there's many different ways you can think about stuff, but you want to have like a functional purpose or an aesthetic purpose to it and reason as to why you're doing what you're doing, in my opinion. Uh, Griebel's can be done well. Like this is a Mike Nash piece, or sorry, a uh, Mike Hill piece. I think that he still picks enough shapes that break the box with enough good hierarchy. For example, he has more medium cuts and big, medium, chunky sizes with very subtle surface details. It doesn't feel overwhelming to the eye. There's a lot of depth to it. Uh, there's lots of material changes. It just feels very purposeful. Uh, the, you know, there's groupings of detailed functional pieces. They communicate with the idea of this engine back here. And so to me, I think there are ways to do so-called greebly parts. And there's also ways to not do them. Uh, so just be careful, you know, when you're placing details, try and place them with purpose, right? So this is a good example to me. There's a lot of rest area, and then there's areas of detail as well. So try and think about why you're placing details, and I think if you're not sure why you're placing something, it's better to hold off than just go crazy. Uh, yeah. The next thing I'd like to talk about is tangents. Now tangents are something that if you're into 2D and you've done a lot of 2D, you know exactly what a tangent is. But when it comes to designing, we need to be thinking in the same way. And I'm not saying, obviously, oh, if you do a tangent, it's the end of the world. Of course not. But in my personal opinion, I like to avoid them. And so a tangent is when basically four lines intersect. And what happens is we create these points. So for example, here, we have all these lines intersecting. And so I think it's important to try and limit these to three lines. Just removing this line here would be enough to make this feel a little bit different. And try and get rid of that point and make it read a little bit easier on the eyes. Um, I see it a lot too in 3D, right? Like it's very easy to take the existing edges alongside of a, like where the poly splits are or the edges of corners are, right? And start splitting your geometry like this. Uh, I think it's really important that when you're making panel work, avoid breaking it on every edge. You know, be very, very intentional where you're breaking your panels. Uh, and I avoid, I would personally avoid making it look like you used the geometry to guide your panels. Because when you are limited by your 3D software, you're really letting the 3D software do the designing. You're not pushing past its its easiest functions. And so if you want to get the most out of your design, don't be limited by these these restrictions of software. Try and build more aesthetic and interesting panel work. So some more examples of tangents. And you have a lot of converging lines like this. I mean, it's usually when there's like four of them. Here is okay, we have three of them. But this area is a little bit unclear. You know, we have a still quite a bit of lines here. And so I see this all the time though when it comes to panel cuts. You know, this one is another panel cut that's creating a tangent with these form changes and these bevels. Same thing here. So I think it's usually good if you're gonna have a panel cut, maybe offset it. So instead of deciding to place it here maybe place it here so it's offset from that corner. Another one that I also see is when it's just the placement of details where they split. It may not be a very clear line, but because these are split here and each new detail starts on the same line, like, so this is a detail area, 
this is a detail area, this is a detail area. Where they end is all in the same points. And so we create these lines. And so what I suggest is trying to maybe make one line that flows past the other ones, or, you know, instead of uh, a rhythm that's like this. Oh, sorry, so it's like this. Maybe offset the outside panel so where this detail ends is right here, right? So we get more space in the middle of empty space and none of those details are gonna be ending on the same, uh, the same lines. Some more examples here. And these are areas where a lot of these lines are converging into tangents. And so I think it's just really important when you're doing your panel cuts to try and avoid these uh, areas. So that's uh, basically all I have to say on tangents. Feel free to let me know if that makes sense and comment below. All right, the next topic I'd like to talk about is illumination, whether it's placing lights or it's just adding lights. In sci-fi, all the time, I see people adding lots of random lights on circles, on capsules, all over a scene. You know, typically what this does is it makes things distracting, but it also feels less functional, right? Sci-fi is about function still. Lighting is going to be lighting, whether it's the year 20 billion, trillion, 1 trillion, or it's like, you know, 1500 BC, you know, the Ice Age fucking dinosaur time so lights do a few things they usually tell you like they're an indicator of something right like if you see a store light it's to call your attention and say hey this is a store here or it's to say oh this device is on or this device is off or it's to provide illumination yes sometimes light is aesthetic absolutely but it's usually used very sparingly and very aesthetically so be very careful and cautious of why you're placing your lights. Try not to go crazy and realize that light sources are the most strong part of your scene and they're gonna attract the eye. So when you are doing them, try and do them with as much purpose as possible. And don't go too crazy. Think of their function or think of their aesthetic uh, reasoning. All right, so the next thing I'd like to talk about in this video is aligning your diagonals and avoiding random diagonals. I think that, you know, it's very normal for people when they're getting started to start adding lots of crazy angles. And while angular design uh, is cool and you can do it right like Deus Ex, I think it's really important to be trying to not add diagonals, just to add detail like and to organize them so that they have some sort of structure to them. So, for example, uh, you know, have only a few sets of diagonals. Don't have 30 different diagonals in your, in your model. Try and align these diagonals across your design. It helps to organize everything and make it feel a bit more simple, even though you have lots of diagonals. You know, it doesn't mean every single one has to be aligned. There's always reasons to break every rule. But I think that the more that you stick with trying to keep things aligned, I think the more professional and organized your your art is going to feel. There's definitely times not to do it, but it's about knowing when to do those, right? Versus doing it and make them all unaligned because you don't know why. Uh, it's also important too, like you can add counter angles. So like for example, this is a nice counter angle. It's almost uh, perpendicular to the dominant angles. You know, yeah, these ones aren't uh, matching any other diagonals. So there are some that don't, but overall I think it's really important that just from an aesthetic standpoint that you try and not make too many unaligned diagonals or just crazy diagonals. You know, be very careful with your angle changes. It's very important that they're not super random all the time. Try and have some sort of order and structure to them and, and reasoning behind it. Uh, yep. All right, so the last thing I'd like to talk about is rest area and 70-30. This is part of a broader topic and is actually a lot more deep than just this, but I'm gonna break it down in two simple ways. Uh, so the idea of rest area is very important and I could talk about this in great detail, but I'm gonna try and not go too crazy. Essentially rest area is the 
area of your design that is simple. Then there is the part of your design where the detail is that is complex. And yes, I'm writing this with a mouse. So you want to think of the proportion of simple to complex. So generally, if you think about Halo or Bungie or something else, you know, usually they have 70% simple and 30% complex. So you can use 70, 30 in many ways. And what it really means is more of this than that. It means hierarchy, uh, primary, secondary, tertiary. I could go into that in great detail, but today I just wanna show a few easy ways to use this. So for example, when you have simple, uh, you can have this maybe instead of being 70% simple on a design, you have it complex. And then this is simple. And so this would be when you see something like Gears of Wars, right? It's more complex than it is simple, where if you see Halo or Destiny, it's more simple than complex. But the point is there's always that contrast between the two. It's never 100% simple, and it's never 100% complex. Um, I mean, unless you're talking about super, super pure product design. But you can also use this for your primary color. So like this could be, in this case, it's gray on this piece. And then the rest is uh, black. So black is that secondary color. And then if we had to have the like small 5, 10%, it would be this yellow caution tape as the tertiary. There's hierarchy to it. So here's another example. Uh, this is one of my environments that I made, and it's just a color view. So you can see that most of it is uh, gray. That's the primary. The secondary is about you know 20, 30% the white material. And then I have a smaller percentage of red, and it's only in functional areas. And then the black is used very sparingly in between transitional areas. So there's this idea of uh, hierarchy. You know, It's not all even. Uh, so that can also be when it comes to simplicity and complexity, right? So here's a concept. And you can see we have, you know, more simple space, more clean space. Then we have detailed space. Using this idea of 70-30 in this way is going to help simplify all of your designs. Um, you know, for example, if we were to take this piece here, there's not any rest area anywhere. So if we were to, t just for example, take this floor and just simplify this a bit. And if we started adding just some nice, strong value change along it. We have a nice, simple piece in the middle. It's going to start feeling like we have a place for our eye to be guided instead of being uh, thrown all around the scene with even amounts of detail. So it's very important to have rest area. Uh, 70-30 can also be used in, uh, this is the final way that I'm going to use 70-30 and talk about it, but proportionally. So like, let's say you have uh, plane changes. Let's say like this is your plane change. This plane change being big, medium, and small. So we have the 70%, the primary, the secondary, and then the tertiary. I guess there's no percent out of 100 left. Or let's say, for example, that you have a line and you're placing a detail on it. Let's say this is like some sort of sci-fi latch. Instead of just placing it right here in the middle where it's at 50, 50, and we place it up at the top or at the start or the end of the line. I'm not saying that you have to do this and it's a 100% rule, but you're gonna find that by doing this, you create areas of detail and areas of rest because now we have this nice, line that guides our eye along to this detail instead of placing them in the middle and killing the directionality we have. There's more reasons why I think it's important to place it up there, but that's just another quick tip and way to use it. So 70, 30, big, medium, small, 
but more importantly, rest area. You know, don't make your stuff too busy. It's a very common thing to do. All right, so I'm hoping that this video is helping people who are just getting started or just getting into sci-fi to maybe start thinking about it differently. You know, try and beyond the things that I mentioned, just try and think about these as real world things. You know, when you design a sci-fi weapon, it still has to be held by somebody or it has to serve some sort of purpose. It's not, you know, magic or make-believe. There's reasons behind choices. Uh, I'm going to include some additional design resources in the description if you'd like to learn more about things uh, beyond this video, you know, artistic rules or, or uh, you know, architectural rules like the book Form, Space, and Order is great and you can apply all of these concepts to, uh, you know, hard surface design. Um, you know, my, I would like to f thank my friend Kai for letting me use some of his old sci-fi in the video. I'll have his art station in the description. Uh, feel free to comment and let me know if you have any more videos you'd like me to make, if you thought this was helpful. Uh, I recorded this at like one in the morning, so hopefully when I read it again, it makes some sense and hopefully you guys find this helpful. So uh, yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Maybe I'll make some more videos like this. Uh, if you would like me to, yeah, let me know. So anyway, thanks for watching.